Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. In this video, I'm going to be talking about manipulation, specifically the methods of manipulation used by Jehovah's Witnesses to recruit people. Now, for each of these methods of manipulation, and there are 11 of them I want to talk about, I'm going to be showing actual video material that clearly shows the way each of these methods are used. We're going to start off with method number one, feigning personal interest, and good examples of the way Jehovah's Witnesses do this and are encouraged to do this can be found in the 2020 Always Rejoice Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. Let's discuss our first skill, asking questions. Why should we ask questions? Questions serve a number of purposes. Sometimes we pose them just to stimulate interest and to get the conversation rolling. At other times, we're interested in hearing how a person thinks so that we can know better how to direct the conversation. Be observant. What do you know about your Bible student? What are the student's circumstances in life? What is the student's family situation? Does the student have hobbies? Interests? Uh, what is the religious background? What does your student believe? Well, be observant and ask good questions. And when you ask a question, give your student time to answer. To ask a question without waiting for the answer would be like making an appointment to meet a friend, but then leaving before he arrived. It was our question. So we should wait for the answer. Wait for it, not in a way that makes people feel uncomfortable, but by listening kindly. By listening, we in effect say, you are important to me. And when the student responds, be positive. Commend the student for being honest, forthright, even if the answer is not exactly what you were hoping for. Of course, it's easy for us to think of questions on topics that interest us. But what is needed is to think of questions that others will enjoy answering. Such questions as, Did you know that the Bible describes a time when sickness will be no more? It's worth just reiterating that the material that we've just been seeing, although it is available on the JW.org website, you can download or anyone can download these videos. This material was specifically intended for a Jehovah's Witness audience. And the purpose of the symposium of talks that these speakers are involved in is to train Jehovah's Witnesses on how to better indoctrinate people, on how to effectively conduct Bible studies, and on how to effectively stimulate interest in people. And one of the foremost ways of doing this, we've just learned, is by pretending to be interested <laughs> in what people's thoughts and ideas are by means of questions. Questions serve a number of purposes. Sometimes we pose them just to stimulate interest and to get the conversation rolling. At other times, we're interested in hearing how a person thinks so that we can know better how to direct the conversation. And as we heard there from David Schaefer, who is a governing body helper, the purpose of asking questions is not to facilitate a two-way dialogue. It's not to have any kind of exchange of ideas where two people are learning from each other and truly understanding each other. No, no, according to David Schaefer, the purpose of asking questions is to direct the conversation. Now, if you've never been one of Jehovah's Witnesses and you're perhaps interested in joining the group because you know a Jehovah's Witness or you've met a Jehovah's Witness, and they're in the early stages of trying to recruit you into the group, it's worth just taking a while to reflect on what we've just seen and what it means. What we've just seen is proof that when Jehovah's Witnesses talk to you or talk to people in their preaching work, 
it's not a two-way conversation. It's not an exchange of ideas. Everything is carefully orchestrated to feign interest, to make the person feel as though their ideas are significant and important, when in many cases they won't be to Jehovah's Witnesses, especially if they contradict Jehovah's Witness beliefs. We've also learned that when Jehovah's Witnesses ask questions, this is a deliberate tactic in investigating people and finding out more information on them, finding out about their family situation, finding out about their job, finding out about their religious background. The more knowledge, the more information you can get on someone, the more you can use it to your advantage if you're in the business of recruiting someone into a cult, because you can anticipate how they're going to answer questions, you can anticipate what's important to them, you can anticipate what their biases will be, and this will really help you in planning your conversion strategy, in steering the conversation, in making sure you have an advantage in coercing someone into joining the group. So make no mistake, Everything we've seen here in terms of asking questions, in terms of training Jehovah's Witnesses in those initial exchanges and indeed exchanges during a Bible study where someone's asking questions, everything we've seen is aimed at manipulating someone into first of all starting a Bible study with Jehovah's Witnesses and then continuing it. So that was our first method of manipulation. We're now going to go to our second, which is preying on insecurity and emotional instability. What are you doing here? We're just asking our neighbors a question. No, no, no. You people and your questions, no one cares. We didn't mean to disturb you. But you did, you did disturb me. So get off my property before I call the police. Those witnesses. Wow, Dad, he was really angry. He was, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, I always try to remember that for years I used to react exactly the same way. Really? Yeah. As you know, I learned the truth in my 20s. Yeah. Growing up in a violent family, it also made me violent. I'm not interested. Go away and don't come back. Wow, so what changed then? Well, you see, one of my good friends died. And that very same weekend, the witnesses came round. Now, normally I'd yell at them, but this time I listened. And that's the beauty of the truth. Anyone can change. And that is one reason why we continue preaching. So shall we continue doing this talk? Yeah. Good. So we've just been watching a dramatization that was shown at the 2019 Love Never Fails Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. And for me, this very clearly demonstrates exploitation. The way Jehovah's Witnesses prey on tragedy and misfortune as a way in, as an opportunity for them to ride to the rescue with all of the answers. In this case, I mean, obviously all of this is fictitious. It's a dramatization. But there's a clear message here. There's an intended message behind this. Jehovah's Witnesses are being told through this dramatization, keep preaching even if people are angry, even if people react badly to your message, because you never know what could change someone. You never know who might die. You never know what tragedy might befall someone that will impair their critical thinking skills and make them vulnerable to joining a cult that rides to the rescue and says, hey, whatever problems you're experiencing, whatever loss, whatever trauma, whatever heartache you're in the grips of, we have the answer. This is clear exploitation. And interestingly, it's not just the people Jehovah's Witnesses are preaching to in the door-to-door -door work, that are prone to this sort of exploitation of tragedy or misfortune. We saw another example of this sort of thinking, again, in the 2020 Always Rejoice Convention, when David Splain gave his final talk. 
And as you probably know, meeting attendance has increased, and inactive and disfellowshipped persons are also trying to draw close to Jehovah. One disfellowshipped person said, I view this as one last warning from Jehovah. Now, just a word to any who may be listening who are no longer serving Jehovah. What are you waiting for? God loves you. God wants you to return. He wants to put his arms around you once more. So please, take advantage of the invitation and come back. And please, don't give in to the idea, well, I've done nothing up to now, and now there's been a pandemic, and if I come back to the truth, well, Jehovah's not going to accept me. Read your Bible. You'll find that in many cases, it was a disaster of some sort that caused people to come to their senses and return to Jehovah, and Jehovah lovingly accepted them. It's just blatant, isn't it? David Splain is here saying to disfellowship Jehovah's Witnesses, people who have been ejected from the Jehovah's Witness organization, usually due to some supposed wrongdoing, he's saying, well, now is your opportunity to come back to show repentance for your wrongdoing because there's a pandemic. I, David Splain, as a governing body member, I'm going to exploit this pandemic and the fear and insecurity it is causing in people as a reason for those that have left or drifted from the organization to work hard to come back and fall under my control once more. What does it say about the merits of the Jehovah's Witness belief system, about the validity of these teachings? if these are the sorts of shady tactics that Jehovah's Witnesses are using, if they're going out in the preaching work and telling one another, oh, well, even if someone's nasty to you, just wait, someone's going to die or something terrible is going to happen and then they'll change their tune and then we'll have a way in. We'll be able to exploit their tragedy. And you also have a governing body member saying, oh, hey, it's a pandemic, therefore the world is ending. Now's the perfect time for those who once believed, who were indoctrinated into thinking that this is the truth and these are the last days. Now's the perfect time for these people to come back because they have the indoctrination already. They haven't managed to shake it off. They haven't managed in the time they've been away from the organization to realize that these aren't the last days and Armageddon isn't coming and we're not the faithful slave. They've held on to parts of their indoctrination and yay, there's a tragedy, there's a catastrophe that's terrifying people. So I'm going to use this window of opportunity to urge people to return. It's shameless, shameless exploitation. But what more can you expect? from a group that so openly manipulates people. And we've barely started our list of 11 methods. We have method number three up next, withholding information. For this example, we're staying with David Splain, but these are his words, not from the 2020 Always Rejoice convention, but from the 2020 annual meeting. And we wondered, why is it that so many people are not taking a stand for the truth. You can probably think of a number of reasons yourself. Some people, for example, are quite happy to learn what the Bible teaches, but they're not willing to act on what the Bible teaches. They're not willing to make drastic changes in their life. How early should I mention the meetings? And uh, what do I do if my Bible student doesn't show up at the meeting? What about opposition? That can be tricky. Bring it up too soon, and uh, you might scare them off. Wait too long, and it may be too late. So just a bit of extra background on what the annual meeting is. Whereas a convention is more of an open event where outsiders are encouraged to come and listen to the talks, An annual meeting is a very exclusive event that's really only intended 
for believing Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's an important distinction to make to help us to understand what David Splain's just been saying and why he was saying it. David Splain, when he was preparing his talk, when he was thinking about what he was going to say in introducing this new Bible study aid, which is the purpose of his talk, he wasn't thinking about outsiders watching this. He wasn't thinking about people who are interested in Jehovah's Witnesses, who've perhaps been contacted and offered a Bible study. He is directing his words towards believing Jehovah's Witnesses who are essentially in on the scam. And if you think about it, what he is suggesting is openly deceiving people, is openly withholding information. He makes clear that a problem with Bible studies and with people accepting Bible studies is that people weren't, quote, making drastic changes in their life. They're not willing to make drastic changes in their life. Apparently, it's not enough to just learn about the Bible. And let's remind ourselves what the book was called before they introduced this latest new book, which is called Enjoy Life Forever. The previous study book was this one, What Can the Bible Teach Us? You can even see on the back cover, it says, ask for a free Bible study. So you can imagine this book would be on the carts that you see in the street. And someone would perhaps take a copy of this and think, oh, well, this is okay. Jehovah's Witnesses are offering like an educational program where they can teach me what's in the Bible so that I can make my own informed decisions if necessary as to how I live my life based on what's in the Bible. I'm learning about the Bible and I have the freedom to make my own informed decisions based on what I learn about what's objectively in the Bible. But we learn from David Splain that that's not really how it works. It's not just about learning what the Bible teaches us. It's actually more about making drastic changes. Imagine how successful this book would be if, if the title was what drastic changes can I make in my life? <laughs> no one would take that book, would they? No one would think, oh, I'm totally going to make drastic changes based on what Jehovah's Witnesses expect of me. That is not, I repeat, not part of the sales pitch. But it wouldn't be much of a scam if they were open and honest in the beginning when they're speaking to people, when they're speaking to interested ones, if they were open and honest about what's expected of them. And David Splain is here laying bare that what's expected of someone who studies with Jehovah's Witnesses is that they make, quote, drastic changes. And he's also openly encouraging Jehovah's Witnesses to withhold information when it comes to opposition. What about opposition? That can be tricky. Bring it up too soon, and uh, you might scare them off. Wait too long, and it may be too late. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness, and you're conducting a Bible study with someone, you don't want to be open and honest with them <laughs> about the fact that you are encouraging them to join a controversial group that has controversial policies for which the organization is receiving criticism. You want to if possible, sweep all of that under the rug until the right moment. There is a time for doing it. You just don't want to do it too soon. You want to wait until the sunk cost fallacy has had time to kick in so that the person has invested so much time already in the study that they are essentially biased in favour of sticking it out. They've invested so many weeks and months so much energy and time in studying about this new religion that they've been introduced to that they may as well overlook the fact that it's controversial and learn more because they've come this far they may as well 
see it out to the end of the study, that they may as well stick it out to the end of the study or even start attending meetings because, hey, the media gets it wrong sometimes. Sometimes the media is biased. How could this group that I've been studying with for so long be such an awful group? They're such nice people, etc., etc. The more heavily invested you are in a group, the easier it is to make excuses. And that's exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses are counting on. That's why they withhold certain information until you have been studying long enough for it not to matter quite so much. And one more example of Jehovah's Witnesses deploying this tactic of withholding information can be seen in a 2020 Always Rejoice convention talk that was given by governing body member Anthony Morris. Now notice in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, 23, and 24, you were taught to put away the old personality that conforms to your former course of conduct and that is being corrupted according to its, that's the old personality, deceptive desires. And you should continue to be made new in your dominant mental attitude and should put on the new personality that was created according to God's will in true righteousness and loyalty. So, we have to understand this clearly and then we need to teach our students there's the old personality. Those of us that came in the truth had old personalities. We know exactly what Paul's writing to the Ephesians about and that's a former course of conduct that is no longer acceptable. But the key to being able to put on the new personality and put away the old one is found in verse 23, be made new in your dominant mental attitude. So, what's that mean? That means your Bible student's thinking has to change. The thinking has to change into this new personality thinking that's guided and directed by Jehovah and his word. When you're approached by Jehovah's Witnesses in the street or when they call at your home, one thing you will never hear them say is, we're here to change your personality. We're here to change who you are as a person because who you are as a person is flawed, is wrong. You need a new personality. You need to be someone different. And we're here to show you who it is that you should be. That's what we've just been hearing from Tony Morris. That is what he is promoting. That people change who they are as people. Sure, he's basing this on a scripture, but what he's doing is saying, oh, the Bible wants you to be a Jehovah's Witness. The Bible, when it says these things, is pointing you towards being one of my followers or accepting my authority as a governing body member that's the only way you can live up to these words of putting on this new personality. It's not so much a Christian personality, it's the personality of a Jehovah's Witness, someone who believes in the authority of Tony Morris and his associates. Again, where is the transparency here? It's one thing to have this idea, this belief, that you are somehow broken or flawed until you become one of Jehovah's Witnesses, until you adopt the personality of a Jehovah's Witness. But if this is a sincerely held belief, why can't that be the title of a book like this? Change your personality <laughs> to the personality of a Jehovah's Witness really should be the title or should be found somewhere in the introduction. There should be some hint that that's where this is going. It's not just about learning more about the Bible. It's not just an intellectual exercise. We want to change who you are as a person. If they genuinely believe this, they should be saying this to people. They should be open, honest and transparent 
when they first encounter people and try to recruit them into the group, they're never going to do that. They're always going to withhold that sort of information until, again, people are so invested in their studies and in the recruitment process that it doesn't matter so much. That's pretty much all I have to say on this particular manipulation method. We move on to method number four, infantilization. Young children are innocent, inexperienced, when it comes to badness. Or put another way, they haven't done many truly bad things. Like children, we don't want to gain knowledge or experience in what is bad. Young children are humble and teachable. Young children ask many questions because they want to learn. But grown-ups are often hesitant to ask questions. Why? They don't want to look uninformed. But acting like we know something when we don't is actually dishonest and probably motivated by pride. The point is, don't be afraid to reveal what you don't know. Remain humble and teachable like a child. Young children are exuberant and enthusiastic. Well, in like manner, we want to remain exuberant and expressive about Jehovah, Jesus, the kingdom, and other spiritual things. We're really seeing two examples here of infantilization rolled into one. We're seeing the overt calls to infantilization. Stephen Lett, as a governing body member, as one of the leaders of Jehovah's Witnesses, wants Jehovah's Witnesses to be more like children in being humble and teachable and compliant. You can understand why it would suit him for his followers to be like that, because then he could get away with more. Then it would be easier for him to coerce Jehovah's Witnesses into doing whatever he wants. Then it's going to be easier for him to control people. But also, you could argue, the overall style of his presentation is also infantilizing. And we see this routinely, not just in Stephen Lett's talks, which are, I guess, a conspicuous example of infantilization in the manner he speaks down to his audience as though they are five or six-year-olds. But we see this with other speakers as well, other governing body members and governing body helpers speak in this incredibly slow, oversimplified way in which they assume their audience knows almost nothing to the point where they will routinely define rudimentary words, expecting their audience not to know what a rudimentary word means. They want their audience to not just be stupid, and childlike, but also feel stupid and childlike and respond in a stupid and childlike way because they need Jehovah's Witnesses to be dependent on them. If you're a child, you're dependent. You need an authority figure. And the governing body, Stephen Lett and his associates, want to be that authority figure to people. So they need people to feel childlike and helpless. And whether they do this intentionally or not is, I guess, up for debate. But it's certainly a clear method that's being deployed intentionally or unintentionally. And it has a very clear benefit when it comes to manipulating people into following the Jehovah's Witness leadership. Anyway, we move on to method number five on my list, which is us versus them thinking and shutting down of criticism. Like Nehemiah, we might encounter opposers who scheme to bring our loyal service to a halt. Some may invite us to meet them halfway, so to speak. They may try to convince us that if we serve Jehovah with just 
a little less zeal, we could pursue worldly goals at the same time. Opposers also spread false accusations against us. In some lands, we're accused of posing a threat to the state. Opposition may also come from those who pretend to serve Jehovah. Just as a fellow Jew tried to get Nehemiah to break God's law to save his life, so former witnesses may try to get us to compromise in one way or another. However, we reject apostates because we know that our lives are saved, not by breaking God's laws, but by keeping them. So this was Governing Body member Samuel Hurd speaking at the 2020 Always Rejoice Convention. He was giving comments summarising the intended take-home messages from a Bible drama about Nehemiah. And we can see very clearly here on open display this us versus them, black and white thinking. Samuel Hurd doesn't want Jehovah's Witnesses to hear the other side of the argument. He doesn't want them to know what the criticisms are, who will know the negatives of being a Jehovah's Witness better than former Jehovah's Witnesses. You sort of have to be a former Jehovah's Witness or at least hear from former Jehovah's Witnesses in order to get a rounded view of the organization and learn what the negatives are, learn what the abusive elements, the manipulative elements, the false elements of this religion are. If you're just going to take it on Samuel Hurd's word, if you're only going to hear one side of the argument, of course you're going to think Samuel Hurd and his colleagues are wonderful. Of course you're going to think it's God's faithful and discreet slave chosen invisibly in 1919. What other conclusion could you possibly reach? If you take everything the organisation says on face value and completely block out what critics and former members have to say, that's what Jehovah's Witnesses are being overtly encouraged to do here. They're not being trusted as adults to reach their own informed conclusions regarding the criticisms of Jehovah's Witnesses. They're not being trusted to figure out for themselves whether these are indeed false accusations. They just have to take it on Samuel Hurd's word that it's impossible to be a former Jehovah's Witness and be a good person. If you're an apostate, if you're a former Jehovah's Witness, if you're an opponent of Jehovah's organization, you must be in league with Satan. You must be evil. It would be dangerous to listen to what people on the other side, people who know about the organization, it would be dangerous to hear from them and hear their arguments. So this is a very clear and obvious example of manipulation. But we must move on to our next example. And for this, we must stay with Samuel Hurd because he's going to explain to Jehovah's Witnesses in a recent JW Broadcasting episode why their best isn't good enough. So ask yourself, how am I doing spiritually? Am I happy with my attendance at Christian meetings? Do I participate by sharing meaningful comments as able? How about my personal study of the Bible? Let me examine my involvement in the ministry. Could I do better in preparing for my return visits? Do I conduct any Bible studies with interested ones? If so, am I content with what I am doing? In effect, you're asking yourself, is my best good enough. We need to compare what we are doing with what we personally could be doing. We need to be active and not become self-satisfied and overconfident. But you may say, I'm doing my best. What more can I do? Take a good look at your best. Scrutinize it. Examine very closely all you're doing with the time that you have. Can mundane activity be replaced with theocratic activity? 
I'm not much of a gamer. I used to be quite into video games in my younger years. I'm sort of hoping that at some point I can get back into it again. I can remember, though, when I was into computer games, I noticed that I didn't enjoy computer games that much if they were too simple. A computer game, if it's going to really grab you, if it's going to be addictive... It needs to hit that sweet spot of being easy enough to potentially master it and hard enough that you don't get bored with it and don't want to move on and do something else. And I'm giving this as an illustration to show the utility of what we've just been hearing here. It is a method of manipulation to convince Jehovah's Witnesses that they are on this never-ending hamster wheel where their best is never quite good enough. There's always something, there's always some area in which they could potentially improve. If you can keep your followers guessing as a cult leader and constantly make them doubt themselves and make them feel as though there's always some mundane activities that they could potentially shed so that they are optimizing their time and energy in service of you, you have greatly enhanced your control over them. Because if, on the other hand, they were to feel as though they were doing everything, they were on top of things, if they ever settled into feeling confident, or as Samuel Heard puts it, self-satisfied, well, where's the thrill? Where's the hook? Samuel Heard needs Jehovah's Witnesses to be constantly doubting and second-guessing themselves and feel as though they always could be doing just that little bit more. And granted, this is more of a manipulation tactic that is deployed against believing Jehovah's Witnesses rather than those who are just interested those who are in the early stages of being recruited into the group. But nonetheless, it's a very potent, very effective manipulation tactic that is routinely deployed against believing members. But we now move on to tactic or method number seven, appeals to emotion. So brothers and sisters, it's our responsibility to learn how to reach the heart of our students so that their thinking, their feelings, their reasonings will move them to be obedient to Jehovah God. Nita was calmly helping Jade to link what she was learning in her study to her relationship with Jehovah God. It was not an intellectual exercise, so to speak, helping her to gain more knowledge about a certain subject. No, it's really helping the student to connect the dots, so to speak, See how the material applies to decisions that they're making in their life. Did you notice in the video that Nita's questions were touching Jade's heart? The, she was skilled at her choice of questions, but also in the tone of voice when she was asking those questions. She was not hurried or impatient to get an answer. She quietly waited for Jade to meditate on the question. Through tactful questions, then, you can help your student to ex examine how they feel about what they are learning. Some simple questions will help you do that. For instance, how do you feel about? Or what convinces you that? Or how would you react if? See, those are excellent questions to help to draw up the inner feelings of your student. As the student's love for Jehovah increases, they'll be motivated to make changes in their lives to please Jehovah God. I decided to use this footage of Gary Bro from the 2020 Always Rejoice convention because this overtly explains the utility of bypassing logical arguments of bypassing any kind of critical thinking component and going straight for the emotions. He's basically giving Jehovah's Witnesses instructions here 
to use this sort of manipulative trickery, but I could actually give you any number of examples in Jehovah's Witness propaganda of the organization leaning on tearful, heart-tugging testimonials, which again are so clearly intended to bypass critical thinking skills. If you can appeal directly to someone's feelings, if you can, quote, reach the heart, you don't need to explain why something is true. It becomes, frankly, irrelevant whether something is true or not. The facts lose relevancy if you can convince someone that feelings matter more than facts. And that's what we have clearly been hearing there in Gary Bro's talk, to the point where he said... It was not an intellectual exercise, so to speak, helping her to gain more knowledge about a certain subject. So we have a clear admission from the organization that studying with Jehovah's Witnesses is not an intellectual exercise. Again, where is that in the introductory pages of their Bible Teach book or now the Enjoy Life Forever book? When are they going to be transparent about that <laughs> when they're trying to promote this free Bible study course? Oh, um, by the way, <laughs> it's not an intellectual exercise. We're more interested in reaching your heart. <laughs> I think if that's how it were pitched, if that's how the organization or Jehovah's Witnesses are going to sell their Bible study to outsiders, outsiders would very quickly realize, oh, okay, okay, so you want to reach my heart, do you? Sounds a bit creepy. Sounds like you're trying to manipulate me. And they are trying to manipulate. This is yet another example of them withholding information, key information that would, if people knew about it, cause them to perhaps decline a Bible study. But again, this is very much a tactic, a method of manipulation used by Jehovah's Witnesses, not just on interested ones, but on believing members. If you can skillfully use appeals to emotion, you can bypass people's critical thinking skills and basically persuade them to accept almost anything. But we must move on to misrepresenting and misquoting experts. Well, sad to say, many people these days take a very casual attitude toward marriage. And when the relationship becomes strained, they just give up and walk out on their mate. But that is not the Christian way. Marriage is to be a lifelong relationship. Just a few verses later on in Matthew 19, verse 9, Jesus taught that the only scriptural ground for dissolving marriage is when an innocent mate chooses not to forgive an adulterous partner. And that is because sexual relations outside the marriage bond are a gross perversion of the one flesh union. Now let's read Paul's words about this at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, Do you not know that anyone who is joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For the two, says he, will be one flesh. So the adulterer pulls away from his marriage mate and makes himself one flesh with a third person. That then is the only scriptural basis for divorce. But divorce is a very painful experience. As one sociologist put it, divorce is drastic surgery. Uh, to sever the one flesh bond between husband and wife would be like sawing oneself asunder. What though if no adultery has been committed? If for some reason, two people who are married to each other just don't like each other any longer. Divorce is not an option. So what we've just been hearing here from Robert Saranko, who is a governing body helper here giving a morning worship talk, what we've just been hearing is, number one, a misquote, and number two, terrible advice. What he's suggesting here is that there is no grounds for divorce outside adultery. And Jehovah's Witnesses take this teaching to the extreme where an abused spouse must stay married. The best they can hope for is separation. They're not allowed to move on with their lives and remarry someone who isn't going to abuse them 
and predictably in case after case this has put abused spouses men and women in abusive relationships in harm's way to the point where their lives are in danger and they don't feel free to move on with their lives this is one of the most dangerous and abusive teachings of jehovah's witnesses but that aside you might be wondering well how is this a misquote well, you heard Robert Saranko there say, But divorce is a very painful experience. As one sociologist put it, divorce is drastic surgery. So in order to give his words importance and relevance, he is here using an appeal to authority, which incidentally is a logical fallacy. He's saying that his arguments are valid because of what a sociologist said about divorce being drastic surgery. You might be wondering, who is this sociologist? Where's this quote come from? I find it interesting that Robert Saranko hasn't been transparent here and simply mentioned in his talk that he's pulled this quote or he's pulled these words from an Awake article, which he clearly has, as I'm going to demonstrate, You'd think if he's going to be transparent, rather than pretending that he's sourced this quote or he's done this research, you'd think he'd be open about the fact that in preparing his comments for morning worship, he's literally just gone on Watchtower Online Library and pulled a, an article on divorce in which the sociologist is quoted. Let's read from the Awake article, the 1982 Awake article from which Robert Saranko pulled these words, with a marriage mate who seems impossible and with a wretched situation in the home, one might reach the stage of thinking that any change must be for the better. There may be a longing for freedom and a single life again. However, the matter is not as simple as that said sociologist Robert Weiss, people need to understand that divorce is drastic surgery. Such expressions indicate the pain that can come from severing the bonds that once existed. These bonds between man and wife include those that are physical, emotional, mental, and in some cases spiritual. To cut all that asunder is indeed drastic surgery and this is not surprising when we consider what the maker of marriage, Almighty God, said after establishing the first such union. A man will leave his father and his mother, and he must stick to his wife, and they must become one flesh. So as with Robert Saranko's talk, for which he's drawn from this Awake article without attributing it, as with Saranko's talk, this Awake article is arguing against divorce full stop so long as there aren't scriptural grounds, in other words, adultery. This article is saying you don't want to get divorced, it's too stressful. This sociologist, Robert Weiss, says it's drastic surgery. Why would you want to undergo drastic surgery for no reason? Best to avoid it. It's a very clear argument divorce is dangerous, divorce is bad, don't get divorced. Which begs the question, what did the full quote say? When Robert Weiss was talking on the subject of divorce, what did he say in context? Well, I did some digging and I found the original quote, which you might be interested, was from a magazine called The Berkeley Barb, it's a 1979 magazine, and Robert Weiss is quoted in an article by R. McCall and H. Stocking titled Divorce, The Myth of Liberation. And here's the quote in full. You decide for yourselves whether Robert Weiss is completely against divorce. Robert S. Weiss a sociologist at the University of Massachusetts at Boston who has studied divorce for many years agrees. I think creative divorce is analogous to creative pneumonia, he said. It's a disabling condition. Of course, marriage can also be horrendous 
and sometimes the only thing to do is to end it. But people need to understand that divorce is drastic surgery. So was Robert Weiss suggesting that you should not consider divorce? You, there are no circumstances in which it would be advisable for someone to get a divorce or end their marriage. Quite clearly not. He quite clearly says there, marriage can also be horrendous and sometimes the only thing to do is to end it. But they're not going to quote those words, are they? The organisation. Robert Saranko is not going to quote those words. They're going to quote mine. They're going to cherry pick and take out of context the one part of those words that agrees with their theology because they want to manipulate people. They want to make it sound as though their ideas and their teachings are supported by sociologists. So they quote mine. They very deceptively pluck words from people who know what they're talking about and completely denude those words of context that negates their beliefs or that contradicts their beliefs in some way. Again, overt manipulation. The organisation, I might add, has been doing this for decades. This, to my knowledge, is the only example of them doing this on camera in the JW Broadcasting era. And I guess it was inevitable that it would show up on camera eventually since they've been making, you know, hundreds and hundreds of videos since 2014 in particular, it was inevitable that at some point one of these misquotes would find its way onto camera. Again, I'm not saying there aren't more. This is just the only one that I'm familiar with. But the organisation has a long track record with misquotes. One of the most egregious misquotes was that at the beginning of the January 2015 Awake magazine. You can see there the title was How Did Life Begin? The version that is in the bound volume, you can see I'm holding up here the bound volume, and on this side you can see the uh, first page which has some paragraphs underneath. These opening paragraphs have been changed from how they read in the original magazine that was printed and circulated. The original magazine that was printed and circulated looked like this. Some might assume that a scientifically minded person would pick evolution and that a religious person would pick creation, but not always. Rama Singh, professor of biology at Canada's Macaster University says, the opposition to evolution goes beyond religious fundamentalism and includes a great many people from educated sections of the population. The clear and obvious implication here is that even biologists and scientists are opposed to evolution. Here's an example, Rama Singh who's pointing out that there is all of this opposition to evolution. So maybe we should start questioning it. Maybe if evolution isn't good enough for Rama Singh, again, an appeal to authority, if evolution isn't good enough for Rama Singh, it's not good enough for you either. You should question it. You should start to doubt the science of evolution. Rama Singh was contacted after this was printed and it didn't go well. <laughs> the article ended up being rewritten so that this is no longer how the beginning of this paragraph or the beginning of this article is worded. And I wrote about the whole thing at the time, as indeed did the Friendly Atheist blog. I'm going to put links below. So if you're interested, you can research what the fallout was, because again, Rama Singh wasn't happy. They cherry picked a quote from an article in which he was complaining about the fact that there was so much ignorance regarding evolution. And as a biologist, it was difficult for him to convince people because of the opposition to evolution. That's the context in which he was talking. 
But if you're a cult in the business of manipulating people, context doesn't matter. Oh, here are some words which, taken from their context, we could somehow twist to make it look like Rama Singh is on our side. It was totally shameless. Watchtower ended up with egg on their face. Obviously, no retraction was printed. We don't know what arrangements they came to with Rama Singh, what personal apologies or, I don't know, what compensation they gave him. But we do know that they misquoted a scientist and got called out and subsequently changed the bound volume to cover up for what they did. This again is manipulation and deception and lying. And another example, which I don't really have time to go into, of the organization manipulating people through misquotes is this book. Life, How Did It Get Here by Evolution or by Creation? Those of my generation who were raised as Jehovah's Witnesses grew up with this book and this was our go-to book for debunking, quote-unquote, evolution and for learning about how evolution was a false teaching and a lie and a massive conspiracy on the part of scientists to draw people away from God. But it turns out that this book is a litany of misquotes from cover to cover. They routinely, again, use appeals to authority and quotes from scientists to make it look as though their views are scientific. But one uh, activist called Alan Feuerbacher has written an entire thesis outlining example by example how they have deceived and how they have misquoted. So I won't go into it now for obvious reasons, but if you do want to check out what some of these misquotes are, I will put a link to Alan's thesis in the description below. And you can do research. You can see for yourself how the organization has tried to manipulate people in this particular publication. But it's a clear method, a clear method of manipulation. What does it say about an organization and the validity of their teachings if they have to resort to such underhanded methods? But we must move on to method number nine, which is recalibrating social dependency. The fact is that our friends affect us in either a good way or a bad way, don't they? In the Hebrew language, to have dealings with someone can mean to keep company with a person, that is, to be friends with a person. If a Bible student seeks company with senseless people, he or she will not progress spiritually. That's why it's so important to help our Bible students to avoid the problems that come with bad association. Friendships in the world are often based on selfish motives. As verse 4 says, wealth attracts friends, poverty drives them away. Such friendships can be shallow and they can end abruptly. Ensure that your student has wholesome association. As time goes by, your student is sure to lose former associates, either because the student decides or the former associates decide. Fill the void and uh, include your student in gatherings, in keeping with his spiritual advancement and as appropriate. Along with helping them to draw close to Jehovah, help your students to replace bad associations with good ones. Be a friend to your students. Introduce them to others in the congregation. Friendships with the world are not only disappointing, but they can also damage our relationship with Jehovah. With good reason, the footnote to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 warns us, Bad associations corrupt good morals. Cultivating friendships with people who do not serve Jehovah is like trying to mix oil with water. It just doesn't work. Why not? Because the scriptures teach that true friends can be found only among Jehovah's people. 
It's also important to help your Bible student understand that bad association is not limited to morally debased people. The Bible tells us that the whole world, the whole world, is lying in the power of the wicked one. So then kindly help your students to see that we must also avoid association with those who may appear to be morally clean, but who lack faith in the true God, Jehovah. In all of these ways, we see why we must help and how we can help our Bible students to avoid bad associations and accept good ones. I mean, what do I even need to say here? This is just such overt manipulation. We can see exactly what's going on. The organization is terrified of people having a social life outside of the organization, outside of people who they would deem approved association. If they can control who people's friends are, if they can calibrate your social circle to their liking so that you're only ever surrounded by people who dote over them and who acknowledge their authority, it's easier for them to control you. It's such an obvious manipulation tactic. When it gets to the point where it's not even about whether the individual is bad association, when it's purely about whether they are a Jehovah's Witness or not, which is what Kenneth Cook just said there. So then kindly help your students to see that we must also avoid association with those who may appear to be morally clean, but who lack faith in the true God, Jehovah. When it's not just about whether people are good or bad, it's purely about whether they have the badge Jehovah's Witness. You can see where this is going and you can see very clearly what the motives are. Why shouldn't you be friends with people who are morally clean? irrespective of what their religious beliefs are. That's not how it works when you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not about whether people are good or not. And Kenneth Cook must know that it's not as simple as saying everyone in the world is evil, everyone in the world is bad. He joined the organisation, I think, as a teenager or as someone who was at least in their late teens, early 20s. He's had experience enough to know that not everyone in the world is a bad person. And that's why he's saying this, because he knows that Jehovah's Witnesses are going to be encountering on a regular basis, particularly if they have jobs, particularly if they're going to school, on a regular basis, they're going to be seeing examples in their lives of fine, honest, upright, principled people who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. And he's here saying, never mind that, you're not to be friends with them unless they accept my authority. I want you to be surrounded by people in your life who acknowledge my authority because then it's going to be easier for me to control you. Obviously, he's not saying that, but that's what he's doing. That's what he's up to. It's manipulation. And we move on to our next method of manipulation which is gaslighting. To show just one way in which Jehovah's Witnesses are routinely gaslit, I want to show you some clips from, again, the 2020 Always Rejoice Convention. And I want you to listen out for the term honest hearts or honest hearted. You are successful in obeying Jesus' words to preach the kingdom message, even when people reject the good news. You can't control how people respond, but you do not let up in preaching the life-saving message of truth. Honest hearts respond to the kingdom message. There are still honest-hearted ones out there, and they desperately need the truth. It's experiences like the ones we've just listened to that help us to see that Jehovah is truly speeding up the work. Notice we're encouraged to boast about Jehovah's holy name. How do we do this? Well, by preaching, teaching, helping others come to know Jehovah and his purposes. And what is the result of this? Well, honest-hearted ones respond favorably, and they began to seek Jehovah. 
So there's a very clear underlying message in each of those clips. If you are honest, if you are an honest hearted one, you will become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Therefore, if you don't become one of Jehovah's Witnesses, or if you reject the Jehovah's Witness message or Jehovah's Witness beliefs, it's because you're not honest. You're not an honest person. And if you think about it, this is gaslighting. And I realize the word gaslighting is used a lot and arguably overused. Sometimes people seem to use it without knowing what it really means. So I thought it would be useful to read the way Wikipedia describes gaslighting. Gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation in which a person or a group covertly sows seeds of doubt in a targeted individual or group, making them question their own memory, perception or judgment. It may evoke changes in them such as cognitive dissonance or low self-esteem rendering the victim additionally dependent on the gaslighter for emotional support and validation. Using denial, misdirection, contradiction and disinformation, gaslighting involves attempts to destabilize the victim and delegitimize the victim's beliefs. And I feel that's what we're seeing whenever the organization is characterizing those who don't accept Jehovah's Witness beliefs as being somehow dishonest or somehow flawed. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, you're thinking, well, if I were to ever reject the beliefs or if the beliefs were to ever not make sense to me anymore, perhaps to the point where my doubts are so numerous that I need to fall away from the organization, that would be my problem. I would be dishonest. That's gaslighting. That's making you doubt your judgment and your integrity. And as Wikipedia notes here, it's a psychological manipulation tactic. And the organization uses it all the time. The honest hearted ones thing is just one example. Here's another example of gaslighting involving the concept of contentiousness. That second peace destroyer, contentiousness. What does that mean? Being disagreeable, argumentative, competitive, terrible quality. It's the product of pride and selfish ambition. And as we read earlier, in James 3, 14 and 15, it's certainly not part of that wisdom that comes down from above, but rather it is earthly, characteristic of earthly humans who are alienated from God. It is animalistic characteristic of animals who lack spirituality and are often contentious with each other. It is even demonic, characteristic of the wicked spirits who are very proud and ambitious. But genuine peacemakers work very hard to avoid these two peace disturbers, jealousy and contentiousness. They neither flaunt their talents, nor do they feel threatened if others are more skilled preachers, teachers, organizers, or shepherds, they're very happy to be considered a lesser one, as Jesus encouraged at Luke 9, 48. Faithfully support those who serve in responsible positions, such as the elders, and obviously doing that. Supporting these ones that are taking the lead definitely promotes peace and joy in the congregation. Again, this is gaslighting. This is making people doubt themselves. If they have certain doubts or certain reservations that are to the disadvantage of the organization, it's not in Stephen Lett's interests, is it, for people to question their leaders, for people to say, hang on, what am I being asked to do here? Does this make sense? Am I being given logical, reasonable, loving, merciful direction here? Or is this actually somehow abusive or exploitative? It's in Stephen Lett's interests to crush that kind of thinking. 
and make his followers as compliant as possible. So he's here telling them that they need to be lesser ones. He's telling them that if they question their superiors, if they question certain decisions, they're at risk of being contentious. And if they're contentious, they're showing, quote, pride and selfish ambition. He's manipulating people. He's making sure his followers are as compliant as possible. And to do that, he is stigmatizing the entire concept of anyone answering back, of anyone questioning authority. Again, clear example of gaslighting, making people doubt their judgment, making people doubt the way they react to certain situations. And this is to do with advice given also in the 2020 Always Rejoice Convention regarding gratitude. So I saw for myself when I was spiritually hungry, how that affected my words and my actions towards the brothers and sisters. The keys to maintaining Jesus' mental disposition are prayer, gratitude, and contentment. My goal is to show a grateful attitude for the blessings that I receive every day, and also to look for the good in people, to show them that I care and I love them. And I've learned the more that I give to the friends and to my family, the happier that makes Jehovah, as Acts 20, 35 and Hebrews 13, 16 mention. Well, no doubt your Bible student is happy with their Bible study and what they're learning about Jehovah. They have deep gratitude. Well, what is gratitude? Gratitude means appreciating uh, what kindness is shown to you, but it also means showing appreciation and returning kindness. Worshiping Jehovah is how we return kindness, show our appreciation and our gratitude. And when we do this, Jehovah is happy, which makes us happy as well. The message here is obvious, isn't it? If you're a grateful person, you're going to worship Jehovah. And by extension, if you're an ungrateful person, you're not going to worship Jehovah. This, again, is making people doubt themselves, isn't it? It's making people feel that if they have doubts, if they have reservations, either about joining the Jehovah's Witnesses or about continuing as a Jehovah's Witness, it must be a problem with them. It can't be the fault of the organization. The problem is with them. They're not being grateful enough. And this, again, is, for me, an obvious example of gaslighting, which is, in turn, as we've seen, a manipulation tactic. But there's one more manipulation tactic that I want to share with you in method number 11, which is used all the time by Jehovah's Witnesses. It's threats of destruction. And who better to show an example of these threats than a governing body member who is making them all the time? Some can't do maybe as much as others, but we have, as Christians, the God-given responsibility to warn others. So you just take a look, and this is the idea Jehovah is getting across at your hands, and you look at your hands. Now, uh, only God, as he looks at your hands in here and all those that are tied in, does he see blood there? The humans sit next to you, they... They might have an idea because they know you well and you haven't been out in service in weeks. Well, guess what? Most likely God's seeing some blood all over your hands. Or they go totally inact and we appeal to them, we try to help, but you cannot water down what God says here. If your hands are not clean because you've been out warning, then they have blood on them and you're going to lose your life. If you're watching this video as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, <laughs> first of all, yes, I know. How shocking is that? Second of all, you might be wondering, why isn't this talk on JW Broadcasting? You know, where can I find this video? I want to see this video for myself because maybe you, an apostate, maybe you've doctored this in some way. <laughs> Maybe this is all some kind of trick. 
it is an authentic Watchtower video. This was actually part of a number of leaks, leaked videos uh, in 2018 that were leaked out from the organization but never made it onto the website. Pillowgate is another example. But this was a branch visit to Trinidad. Uh, the talk was actually given on January 13th, 2018. And for understandable reasons, I don't think you're ever going to see it on JW.org. Because how do you defend that rhetoric? What Tony Morris has just been doing, using incredibly triggering, obscene language about blood on people's hands, what he's just been doing is telling Jehovah's Witnesses that they're going to die at Armageddon if they don't preach enough. If they've been skipping the preaching work for weeks, so let's say two weeks, it's been two weeks since they were last doing the preaching work, they're not trying hard enough, and therefore they have blood on their hands, they are blood guilty, because they haven't been warning people about Armageddon coming, therefore people will die at Armageddon because they haven't become Jehovah's Witnesses, because they haven't been preached to, therefore it's the responsibility of the Jehovah's Witnesses who weren't doing enough preaching, and therefore those Jehovah's Witnesses deserve to die. So it's not even just a case of being a Jehovah's Witness if you want to survive Armageddon, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about your best is never good enough. <laughs> You've got to constantly be doubting yourself, which again is gaslighting, isn't it? Making someone feel like they can never relax. You're always on edge. You're always thinking, oh, I need to do a bit more. I haven't been preaching since last Thursday, I need to get out again, or I'll be blood guilty, I'll be responsible for the deaths of people that I haven't been warning. And so threats of destruction, I mean, we're now tapping into very primal fears, aren't we? If you are fearful of death, of literally your life ending, unless you fall in line, unless you comply with instructions, you are going to fall over yourself to correct that. You are going to fall over yourself to comply with whatever's being expected of you. This is open and overt manipulation. <laughs> when, when we get to the point where you're saying to someone, do this or you'll die, <laughs> that's about as manipulative as it can possibly get. And again, it's not just about people who don't believe, people who are on the outside, worldly people dying at Armageddon, even Jehovah's Witnesses can be on the wrong end of a fireball if they're not putting in enough hours in the preaching work. But there's another example of this form of manipulation that I wanted to show you, and it's from the same individual. Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world is making himself an enemy of God. So, what a clear warning. We don't want to have any friendship, whether socially or on social networks, uh, with Jehovah's enemies. We're not friends of the world. We're Jehovah's friends. Uh, we're uh, looking at him as our closest and most precious friend, and we never would want Jehovah to view us as an enemy. So, in conclusion, let's go back to that opening psalm that we looked at here. Just to help this verse stay in your mind, we hope, uh, verse 20, just to emphasize this, but the wicked will perish, the enemies of Jehovah will vanish like glorious pastures, particularly they will vanish like smoke. So this, I thought this would be a nice memory aid to this verse stay in the mind. Here's what Jehovah's promising. Hey. <laughs> That's Jehovah's enemies. They're going to vanish like smoke. This clip just never gets old. It's... 
It's just disgusting, isn't it? Does anything more potently display the arrogance of this man than him overtly and blatantly relishing the destruction of those who question his authority, which is what we're seeing here. He is relishing the annihilation, not just the sidelining, not just the irrelevance, not just people ignoring his critics. He is relishing, as a governing body member, the death and destruction of those who don't recognize his authority. And as I've explained before, the current teaching is that when Armageddon strikes, the governing body believe that they will be involved in the slaughter themselves. They will be, I don't know, raptured to heaven <laughs> during the Great Tribulation at some point so that they can get in on the act. They can be participating directly in going round and killing people like me who are opposers who don't deserve to live because we don't recognize their authority. What arrogance, what fanaticism to have that outlook. But again, apart from being, you know, clear arrogance, this is manipulation, isn't it? It again taps into this very primal and justifiable urge that we all have to exist. We want to live, you know, unless obviously we have mental health problems or we're struggling with depression and feelings of suicide. Under healthy circumstances, it's natural that we would want to survive, we, that we wouldn't want to be executed as heretics. And what Tony Morris is doing there very graphically, even using the visual aid of blowing out a match, is he's saying, follow me or die. It's a direct and clear threat of destruction. And again, obvious manipulation, just as with all of the other methods that we've discussed. And as I've mentioned previously, and it's worth stressing this point, if you are watching this as one of Jehovah's Witnesses or perhaps someone who holds a candle for Jehovah's Witness beliefs, what does it say about the religion if they have to resort to these underhanded dark arts of manipulation? If it's really the truth, shouldn't it just be a case of sharing the good news? Shouldn't that be enough? Shouldn't it be enough to just be open and transparent and say, here's what the Bible teaches, here's what God expects of you, take it or leave it? What does it say about an organization that does all this if they have to stoop to these depths in order for their beliefs to make sense, in order to recruit people? It can't be true, can it? If people need to be tricked in order to become Jehovah's Witnesses, how can Jehovah's Witnesses really call themselves the truth? So I hope this information has been useful for you. I might just add right at the end that this video was voted for by my patrons. So huge thanks to my patrons for making me tackle this subject. I initially wanted to revisit the Jade and Nita dramatizations from the Always Rejoice convention, but I figured I've already done this in a video, and if Tibor is gracious, he will show the thumbnail here. If you want to drill down even deeper into the way Jehovah's Witnesses manipulate people as part of the recruitment process, I can't think of a better example than just watching this video, because it's all there. But again, what does it say? about an organization that needs to trick people in order for the beliefs to make sense. I hope you've enjoyed this video though. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching. <laughs>